the Honourable Member for Murchison. Um, Mr President, I would just like to clarify that I understand from direct communication that for the TLRI um, its work, they cannot consider a bill currently before the House. They need this resolved um, before they can actually undertake their work. And referring it to a committee would have left it on the table and they couldn't have done the work. So that's the reality. So, Mr President, we have a bill before us that seeks to achieve a number of changes. <coughs> The intent of which I fully support. Tasmania does need to be compliant with Commonwealth <coughs> law, in this case the Marriage Act of 1961. So the so-called no, so no force divorce provision contained within this bill does need to, pro to proceed as soon as possible. And we've already been non-compliant since December 10 last year. When the debate last year didn't occur on the second reading, all members of this place made speeches on the adjournment regarding this, and I won't revisit that matter at this time. I was, like I assume most other members, ready to debate the second reading of the bill, but we didn't even get that far. Mr President, we are here to debate a bill that, has, as it has been presented in this House, that is not supported by the government. A unique and unusual occurrence, I and other members do have a significant number of amendments to this bill to deal with. Um, that should the bill make it to the committee stage. So at this time, I'll be confining my comments to the broad intent of this bill, with some reference to those amendments as appropriate. Mr. Pres Madam Deputy President, uh, Acting President, sorry, I circulated these amendments as soon as possible after the drafting of the amendments, um, and, and members have copy of, so members had a copy of them to enable full consideration and time to consult as well as to provide the opportunity for other members to seek further amendments to those I've presented if they wish to, and I know other members have done that. The bill has created a significant debate in the general public, and in many ways that's a good thing. It hasn't been such a good thing for some. However, some of the mistruths and some of the cases of outright lies that have been peddled by some in the public discussion last year have been appalling and has led to a great degree of confusion for members of the public. I cannot for the life of me understand why we need to spread such hate and fear about a matter that will not directly impact the majority of Tasmanians. Perhaps we should reflect on last year's, oh, yeah, the year before now, Victorian election, where the politics of fears were, fear were rejected. An agenda based on exclusion, judgment and fear were rejected. I believe we should consider on that as we consider this bill and the policy intent behind it. To reflect briefly on the history of this bill, this bill originated in another place by the <coughs> government to take action on addressing the national consistency requirement following the passage of legislation related to marriage equality and address the so-called no forced divorce requirement that will result, that has resulted with a removal of, um, or will will result in the removal of an exemption for registrars of births, deaths and marriages, thus enabling them to solemnise marriages between two people regardless of their sex or gender. The requirement to change state and territory legislation to remove this inconsistency with Commonwealth law had been known about by all states and territories for over 12 months last year when it was actually brought to us. As the second reading speech delivered by the Attorney General in another place stated, on 9 December 2017, the Commonwealth Marriage Amendment Definition of Religious Freedoms Act 2017 amended the Marriage Act 1961 to allow same-sex couples to marry. The states and territories were given 12 months until 9 December 2018 to change their own laws to ensure they are consistent with Commonwealth legislation. So the government has been well aware of these requirements since late 2017. So last year, at the final hour of our, of our last sitting week, we were seeking to address this necessity and time-sensitive issue. This legislation before us, among other things, seeks to ensure transgender people who have gender, who have gender reassignment surgery cannot be forced to divorce. The Commonwealth Marriage Amendment Definition and Religious Freedoms Act 2017 repealed the forced divorce exemption in subsection 45, oh, 40 subclause 5 of the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act 1984. And this bill before us um, seeks to amend section 28A and 28C, the Births, Deaths and Marriages <coughs> Registration Act 1999, to remove the requirement that a person applying to register their sex, a change of sex, not be married. 
The bill, as presented by the government, also included a range of amendments to other acts, including the Civil Liability Act 2002, the Anti Discrimination Act 1988, Criminal Code 1924, the Adoption Act 1988, and the Status of Children Act 1974. Some have argued a number of these changes in the bill, as presented in the other place, were not necessary, such as using the gender neutral term parent rather than father or mother and that may be something that's progressed further in committee as well. I understand the government brought that in um, on the advice of parliamentary council who prefer to use one term in the, when you don't, that can suffice when you don't need to use three, parent as opposed to mother or father. Mr President, we all know that a number of amend other amendments were inserted into this bill that directly relate to transgender and intersex people by parties other than the government. This bill does, in, it, in the form the government presented, it did refer to gender because it was about removing that um, forced divorce component for transgender people. It did refer to gender. These amendments were supported in another place by a majority, and thus we now have the bill before us. Whilst there's been quite a degree of angst regarding some of the government proposals in the bill, there has also been a degree of public comment and concern expressed about the non-government amendments. Mr President, the majority of amendments to legislation that are supported in this place are also non-government amendments. I'm talking about in this place. The majority of amendments moved here are made by non-government members. And they're supported and they go back down It's not all of them, but a lot of them, majority of them are. Sometimes, as I said, these are not supported by the government, but are supported by this House and ultimately accepted by the government in the other place and become law. That's how it works. Ms. Madam Acting President, my job here is to assess the bill before us on its merit. Mr President, to focus on the additional changes made to the bill in the other place, I note there is a long international history of need for change, similar to that proposed in the bill before us. Sweden was the first nation to allow legal gen change of gender in 1972. The current best, pra best practice in terms of international human rights is to leave gender markers off identity documents in the same way we leave off race. The Federal Government also makes changes to remove the requirement for surgery re regarding areas covered by the Commonwealth, as has the ACT, Western Australia, South Australia um, in their state and territory legislation. Gender markers have been off driver's licences in all states for over a decade. The sun has still come up each day and there has not been any loss of awareness of gender. So let's look at the bill before us, particularly if amended, as I seek to do, actually does as well as what it doesn't do. Someone, yeah. Um, this first, this bill will remove the requirement that a person applying to register their change of sex to not be married. That is, they can be married to another person of the same sex. Second, this bill will give parents the choice of having their, the gender of their baby recorded on the birth certificate or not having the gender recorded on their birth certificate. This bill will enable a birth certificate to be issued with the current and relevant details, including name and date of birth of the person without any details such as an incorrect name and or gender also being recorded on the birth certificate when issued. This bill will enable transgender people to change the gender on their birth certificates without the need to undergo major and risky surgery when they identify as a gender different to that on their birth certificate at the time. Five, this bill will not change the way trans or intersex people live or what they do from day to day. It won't make people become transgender. This bill will not, will not stop the register recording the gender or other relevant birth details that the birth, registrar of birth, deaths and marriages is legally required to maintain to ensure historical records are maintained if my amendments are supported. This bill will not enable details of birth to be uh, sorry, will not enable details of birth as recorded to be erased from the historic register that must be maintained by the registrar. And this bill will not give transgender people who have not undergone re gender reassignment surgery access to any areas they cannot access now. People do not register sorry, people who do register a change of gender will still be required to abide by all the laws of this state, as we all do. So, there have been two main areas of concern raised. First has been on the fact that the gender will not appear on birth certificates, or may not appear on birth certificates. This upsets some people, even though anyone who wants their gender noted on their birth certificate or their child's birth certificate can easily do so. 
and, and hardly notice any change the certificate will effectively look the same. I believe the vast majority of people will select this option and thus nothing will change. A birth certificate issued will essentially be the same as it, um, it, as it is, it was, and it won't actually change. Secondly, the other concern relates to whether trans people should be able to change gender without surgery. And it seems everyone has, well not everyone, but a lot of people have a strong opinion, and, um, or an opinion, and certainly a strong one at times on this matter. So I acknowledge and thank all those who provided briefings to us last year on this topic and those who have assisted in drafting, am drafting amendments to the bill before us. Mr President, I've consulted broadly on this... Sorry, Madam Acting President, I've consulted broadly on this bill and uh, the amendments I have prepared. Um, I particularly wish to thank again Robin Webb from OPC for her professionalism, her insight, attention to detail and steadfast approach to ensure our laws achieve the policy intent and do not create conflicts as much as any drafter of legislation can. Mm -hmm. her, yeah, that, I mean, her reputation's on the line here. I have con and, and constant criticism of that is, I think, would be quite um, distressing for her to hear. I have also consulted with the Children's Commissioner, the Australian Christian Lobby, other groups and individuals opposed to these changes, including representatives of Women Speak Tasmania. For me, the most powerful group I, and I believe we heard from last year, was the parents of trans kids. Some of them are in the chamber this evening. People with a very real lived experience and having a real insight into the need for this reform. They're the ones that are feeling the pain with delays in this. Mr President, uh, Mr. President um, over recent months we've met people like Ryan Myers, Martine Delaney and Dee Dee River. People who also share, share a lived experience, who are older and perhaps more articulate than some of our younger people may be. I've had meetings with parents of trans children and young adults. I've had many lengthy <coughs> meetings with people who are experienced in and presenting arguments that are often technical about amendments, data processing and so on. They have real expertise in this area and we should respect that. These older members of the trans community have, been, have had years of dealing with these challenges and have worked in areas that might provide insight into drafting of legislation and data collection and storage, for example, and I've used, I've, I've sought that um, advice and that knowledge. It's easy to forget that in many cases the trans community are young people and that they may feel insecure and even threatened in being put in the spotlight. Almost all, if not all, trans people have experienced prejudice, discrimination and harm during their lives directly related to their gender identity. They certainly have to be brave to assert their gender identity in schools or with their parents. Parents don't ask to have trans kids. Children don't ask to be trans. It's something they are and often struggle with. Saying to, some, to anyone, parents, peers, whoever, I'm trans or I'm really a girl or boy, is an incredibly difficult thing for a child to do, or an adult even to do. It's, it's likely to be in a struggle to say to oneself and then a major struggle with the world. It's likely to lead to bullying and ostracisation. Evidence suggests it may lead to threats and, and assault, and there is plenty of evidence of that. And almost certainly mean hearing hateful comments. And haven't we seen that over the last little while? While these kids <coughs> have to be brave, it is often an inner desperation, not courage, that leads them to speak. And once they do, most just want to keep their head down. And it's not the way they want to be, have the focus, attention focused on them. It's not the kind of attention they want. When they think, when they can, I think, a lot of people prefer not to have to think about being trans. They just want to be themselves, as I think we all do. This is what this legislation is all about. Allowing people, especially young people, to be themselves. Not putting a spotlight on them, allowing them to be themselves without having everyone pry into their gender or genitals. For many trans people, the most significant part of this legislation is the elimination of requirement for surgery and medical um, approval. That and the ability to say what their gender actually is. The surgery requirement is one that stops almost all trans people from changing their legal identity on the birth certificate or on the register. I would ask why we should require people to undergo major, invasive and complex surgery with all the inherent risks if they don't wish to. Especially um, 
to meet the expectation of broader society that expects them to look a certain way. <coughs> we don't, and I don't believe we should, require all morbidly obese people to have risky bariatric surgery to conform with the view that we have of a normal healthy body. This current requirement impacts all people to change their legal gender. It is a major barrier for transgender men. It is a problem for non-binary people and anyone who doesn't feel their gender resides in their genitals. Some people have other underlying medical conditions that mean they cannot have such major surgery. It is a problem for those who cannot do this for medical reasons. The surgery requirement is even a barrier for those who want such surgery. I understand the cost of this surgery for transgender women is over $25,000 and it's not covered by Medicare or private health insurance. And that is just the base cost for the simpler form of surgery. This cost does not include other costs associated with time off work or the fact that there are almost no surgeons in Australia perform such surgery. So surgery usually entails overseas travel with all the associated travel costs. Granting of permission to have surgery involves at least one year of living as the gendered identity while being monitored by a psychiatrist with regular visits and then getting a second psychiatrist to grant final approval. I'm not suggesting this should change. What I am suggesting is, is this, that this is a very long and convoluted process, living with an identification document that is not a true representation of who you are. Enabling people to have their gender removed from or changed on their birth certificate or on the register and thus their birth certificate enables them to live as they are, subject to all the laws that apply to all of us. Trans people have not, who have not had surgery may take the opportunity to remove or change their gender on, from the birth certificate while still... Um, we will still require working with children and vulnerable people checks if they are working or volunteering in areas where children or vulnerable people are. They will, subject to they will be subject to prosecution if they assault anyone for whatever reason. They, need, they will need to abide by policy set by schools, sporting organisations and other organisations they interact with. Just as we all do. Currently, the law requires sexual reassignment surgery to change gender on a birth certificate. And in, and in spite of what some suggest, a hysterectomy, for example, and thus sterilisation, would not be good enough. The law says sexual reassignment surgery means a surgical procedure involving the alteration of a person's reproductive organs carried out, A, for the purpose of assisting the person to be considered to be a member of the opposite sex, or B, to correct an, or eliminate ambiguities relating to the sex of a person. So a hysterectomy doesn't rearrange genitals in a way that assists the person to be considered a member of the opposite sex, and probably is not even necessary. This, uh, what that would require surgery, this is for the, um, a full sexual reassignment surgery, that would require surgery that costs around $100,000 and takes a number of months. And as I said, I've been told this is not available in Australia. And many people, trans people feel they do not want or need such invasive surgery, even if they could afford it. Removing this surgery requirement has been done federally and in the ACT, WA and South Australia. The change to gender markers on birth certificates will have a particularly strong impact on young people. They are the people who need birth certificates to prove their age and to generate photo ID. If their birth certificate includes their original name and gender and the children don't look like the gender on their birth certificate, <coughs> this can be very confronting and is unnecessary to prove your identity. Your gender is not a form of your identity for the purposes of for an identity document. The ability to have no gender on a birth certificate means someone can check a child's age and take their gender to be exactly what it seems if they choose not to have it on. I believe a lot of these, um, a lot of transgender young people will actually choose to have their new, their, the, the gender they identify with on their birth certificate. The ability to have the right name means the same. The changes will assist and positively impact on children the most. Interestingly, you can't, a parent can't choose a child's, can't change a child's name without the child's consent after the child is 12 years of age. So children as young as 12 can make a decision about that. And, and as term, in terms of identity, that's more significant than your gender. It will help older trans people, of course, young women and men, but they will often be able to use their driver's licence or a passport for ID. As we age, the birth certificate becomes less important. 
Of course, older people face problems when a birth certificate says they ha are gender different to the way they look, and open this opens them up for discrimination. Mr President, the birth certificate is an identity document. It is not intended to confirm a person's gender. It does not conf confirm or reflect genetic heritage. There is no paternity test undertaken prior to registration of the birth. And as a midwife, I know this can be sometimes of a challenge at times because um, we don't do, we don't actually do paternity testing. We put the father's name on there and just assume it's right. Well, we don't, the parent does. Because the parents uh, or, parent or parents are not necessarily blood relatives, a birth certificate cannot be used for heritable conditions, such, uh, except as ID for obtaining medical records. Health records track health information for a child. The registrar does not collect information regarding the health of a person. A birth certificate is used in various contexts as an identity document. In these contexts, it is used for young people as proof of age, for people requesting government services as proof of citizenship when a place of birth is relevant, and for international travel documents as proof of citizenship when place, where place of birth is relevant. A birth certificate is, has no identifying information trying to, uh, tying it to a particular person other than the parents' names. This is how people have stolen the identity of a person who died in childhood. It, it is actually the start of a paper trail. For other legal purposes, legal identification papers are not changed without legal process, applications or statement of change. Whether a change of name is on a birth certificate or by deed poll, there is a paper trail. When it's changed on a driver's licence, there is a paper trail. When it's changed on a passport, there is a paper trail. It is not necessary, and, and if, if gender is changed under the amendments proposed, um, there will be a paper trail. It is not necessary to include former names on a person's ID. Law enforcement agencies rarely need to go to the birth certificate to identify someone unless the paper trail is in doubt or in cases of identity theft. They go to more recent documents, preferred with, with photos and facial recognition. Identity has become, a much, has become a more central issue to policing and there is a, currently a raft of elements that, to help build an identity profile of a person, including facial recognition software, voice recognition and data matching with phone rec records, social security, taxation, land ownership, car and boat registration and bank records to identify and track flows of income, for example. So who will these changes impact and why does it matter so much? And who does it matter to? In some cases, the need for these changes goes beyond the exclusion and harassment of trans people's experience. Mr President, it matters for people like Rosemary Harwood and her daughter Marjorie, known to her as Marty. For Marjorie Harwood, it meant that in spite of policies intended to keep trans people from harm, Marjorie was sent to the men's, Risen Men's Prison. She had transitioned in the, in the 80s and faced a lifetime of bullying and discrimination and ultimately turned to drink and petty crime. <coughs> Marty's change of gender was not recognised in, by the justice system in Tasmania and she found herself facing imprisonment <coughs> for these crimes she committed. This matters because in spite of pleas from her mother, she was apparently sent to the male section of Eastern <coughs> Prison on the strength of the gender listed on her birth certificate. Mr President, while there, according to Lawyers Weekly, she allegedly was gang raped, resulting in injuries severe, severe enough to require a colostomy. <coughs> I ask members to try and imagine and reflect on the brutality of these rapes and violence she experienced to cause so much physical harm. According to the article, she was hospitalised. A hospital prison did not report the assault. Marjorie, who, who had also suffered from childhood with a kidney disease, ended her own life by refusing dialysis or other treatment. Her stated intent was to die. And in July 2017, she did so. I understand there are policies in place aimed at preventing this sort of event. However, if one put, puts a trans woman in a men's prison, <coughs> assault is almost inevitable, inevitable, rape is likely and death is clearly possible. Likewise, putting a trans man who is, because of the current requirements of surgery, is likely to have a vagina into the, a men's prison will also almost inevitably lead to assault, probably lead to rape and possibly again of the death of that person. This is why prisons, prisons need to take trans people on a person-by-person -person basis, with the primary obligation being duty of care. So, Mr President, this bill matters to people like Marty, and the law needs to change to create a safer society for transgender people. Mr President, it matters to the parents of transgender children, as well as those children themselves. 
This law reform matters to a 15-year-old transgender person seeking their first job. Uh, that they, are, they can be taken as they are rather than who they are outed by through their birth certificate. That is wrong and misrepresents them and creates a very real risk in many cases of the lived reality of discrimination. Mr President, this is the real and lived experience of the people this bill will impact. Mr President, one of those parents who met with us last year emailed me following the meeting. I'll share just a small de-identified section of the email to highlight why this is important from the heart of a parent. Quote, I feel I need to do everything I can to help my child, so I write to you now to back up what we said today about this legislation change being made, being a way to make the world a safer place for our children. Our children didn't make a choice to be the way they are. It is in their genetic makeup, it is their identity, and their identity is their own. They cannot deny who they are. These amendments will allow them to change their birth certificate without having to have invasive surgery to move their reproductive organs. What a barbaric thing to expect them to do." End quote. Um, this parent also mentions the principle of harm reduction, writing, and I continue the quote, it is inevitable that enlightened people also see the people, that people should not be forced to have invasive surgery to prove that they are the gender that I, they identify as. In fact, the majority of people will not even know there is a difference. These changes simply won't affect them. But for the 2% of people who are transgender or born with indeterminate sex or intersex, this will have an immense benefit in improving their lives and easing the stress they go through in a negotiating world that holds a lot of prejudice toward them." End quote. Mr President, I know we have all received many emails, both in support and opposing these changes. Many opposing have been on the basis of the removal of terms mother and father, certainly in the early time it was, and a number showing an unfortunate lack of understanding of the intent of the proposed amendments. Mr President, unfortunately at, this time, at, at the time this bill was presented in this place, many of these matters were being misrepresented in the media, with much comment on these important matters being anything but accurate. Personally, I believe some of this may have been deliberate. Comment from senior politicians right up to the Prime Minister have fuelled this misinformation. This confusion has led to emails from Tasmanians expressing concern. I have personally called a number of my constituents who have expressed concern regarding the bill before us to talk to them about the proposed changes. And by and large, when they understand the application of these proposed changes, they accept, they have misunderstood, and their concern was based, was being based primarily on media comment. I've also informed members of the public that I recognise um, a number of concerns regarding the current drafting, as I mentioned earlier, and I again sincerely thank OPC for the significant assistance in drafting a set of amendments with the, to maintain the policy intent and also maintain the integrity of the register. The pleas from members of the public to support this change have come from a wide range of people, with the majority of people being directly impacted one way or another, being transgender, intersex or non-binary themselves, or having a family member who is, but not just those people. An example of the type of email requesting support includes, in part, these comments, and I quote, we are 56 and 60 years old, respectively, and while childhood is a long time ago, neither of us can recall a time when we or anyone close to us required a copy of our birth certificate to establish our sex. It is pretty clear to us that having details of their sex at birth on people's birth certificate has made life very difficult for a number of people in our community. These people already face a lot of hurdles and problems." End quote. What I find interesting is the level of misunderstanding within the community about this issue in a broader sense. Some seem to believe that they will have to fill out a statutory declaration confirming the sex of their baby at birth and other times to register the baby's birth and or get a birth certificate. All wrong. Others believe that no gender will be recorded at all in the birth details. Completely wrong. Others believe this will prevent them from including gender on their own birth certificate or the birth certificate of their, ch children, their child or other children. Completely wrong. Many people opposing these changes appear not to appreciate the very real challenges parents of intersex babies face when they are required to identify the sex of the baby and decide on a name for that baby within 60 days. And this may be that the sex of the baby cannot be determined until much later. The registrar does have the power to accept late registration and power to correct an entry when it's necessary to do so. Um, but I, st t I still support the extension for the parents to register the birth to 120 days to enable that extra time if it's needed. I absolutely support the view that parents should not be forced to make a determination about the sex of their baby when it's unclear, and no baby should be subject to so-called corrective surgery until they're in a position to give their own consent. 
Many parents also wish to or need to apply for birth certificate for their child to access services. <coughs> Removing the requirement to include a gender marker on the birth certificate will assist the child and the parents at a challenging time. Or at least they'll be able to have the right gender that they identify as on their certificate if they register a change. As I mentioned, gender was removed from driver's licence over a decade ago. The only time gender as an um, identifying feature has been used in the past was, for this purpose was prior to the passage of the legislation supporting marriage equality, where a celebrant may have needed to confirm that they were not marrying a couple who were of the same sex. This requirement is no longer necessary, and this is the reason we find ourselves here dealing with this legislation, including the original bill from the government. So there is a need to add, so there is no need at all to include it. Allowing people the choice of whether to include gender on their birth certificate enhances and provides real parental choice and will have absolutely no impact on those who wish to have it included. The change will have significant impact on parents of intersex babies, pa uh, parents who choose not to list gender for whatever reason, um, and importantly, young people who are transgender who are required to use their birth certificate to gain employment, enrol at some schools, or all schools, I believe, open a bank account or a range of other requirements when they need to prove their identity, that being their name, their date of birth, place of birth. These are all occasions when they are currently being disadvantaged and discriminated against by having a former and no longer accurate name and or gender recorded at the top of their certificate. Parents um, have explained the desire for these changes, describing the experiences of, the, of their children seeking employment. One parent wrote, and I quote, she recently inquired into the application process for the local employees in our area and all have required ID in the form of her birth certificate and or passport. Her birth certificate, despite having gone through a process of a legal name change at significant financial cost, record, records at the very top of it her former name and an incorrect gender. It is a useless document for her as it outs her immediately, leaving her open to potential discrimination, bullying and unnecessary public scrutiny in relation to their private gender identity." End quote. And sections of another sharing the lived experience of their child. I quote, we write to you as proud parents of an equally proud transgender daughter. We are in the minority who this past week have continued to witness examples of the hatred that, our, that we fear our innocent daughter is inevitably going to experience throughout her life. The hatred that to date we have been able to shelter our child and her siblings from, while at the same time delivering a message of acceptance to those that we encounter who might display reluctance to accept who our family is. The opportunity that which you currently have is one that you can deliver a message to our children that their welfare is as important as every other child by helping to prevent the discrimination that those before them have had to endure and in turn lay the foundations in the community that acceptance and tolerance is more important than what's written on a piece of paper. While the majority of people will not be affected by these changes before you, the benefits of those impacted are immeasurable. They will be afforded a chance of normality and the freedom of being who they are and choosing who they share their story with, something which admittedly most of us take for granted. We want what every other parent wants, and that's for our children to experience everything that life has to offer. These change, the changes proposed will allow this." End quote. Mr President, I could read many other accounts, including the voices of families directly impacted. I know many other, other members may um, do so, but we've all, I think we've all received the pretty much the same emails and messages um, and these letters of heartfelt, with heartfelt pleas. Mr President, these are the real and lived experience that we must consider in our decision making. It doesn't mean we don't listen to other people, but we must listen to these people. If we do not stand up for the people from minority and marginalised groups, who will? Who will? Who will, listen, who will stand up for these marginalised and disadvantaged groups in the community if we don't? If I don't? That's what I'm doing. I'm standing up for these people who aren't represented in this place. Mr President, the examples of such personal experiences are more common than I think many members of the public, uh, many members and the public believe or realise. These young people and children experience challenges that we, who are not transgender, cannot understand. Mr President, as I said, we must also listen to those who have opposing views, as they can also shed light on some of the potential challenges a change to legislation may bring. I have done this as well and responded to, the, to a number of those who have raised legitimate concern. 
and I have listened to all of those people. M Mr President, I have listened intently to all people who have spoken and communi communicated with me on this matter, including going to a public forum that Women Speak Tasmania held just the other day, other evening, um, and have assisted in the preparation of the amendments I propose to move if we get into the committee stage. The best we can do is to believe those who have the real lived experience. Believe in them. Order. The Honourable the, uh, Member for Moses has the floor, so I know the uh, voices aren't too loud, but uh, I think the Honourable Member would rather proceed without... Uh... I find it disrespectful, Mr President. Yeah. Oh, we'll go back. Mr President, of course you must listen to those yeah. who have opposing views, as they can also shed light on some of the potential challenges this legislation may bring. I have done this, as well as responded to a number of those who have raised legitimate concerns. I have listened intently to all people who have spoken and communicated me with this, on this matter, and this is assisting the preparation of the amendments I propose to move if we get into committee stage. And this is why uh, the transgender community don't fully support the amendments I'm proposing, because I've listened to a range of voices, not just them, even though their voice is very important in this, I have listened to all voices. And I've worked really hard with Robin Webb of um, OPC to make sure we get legislation that is workable, that is, is, is legally correct, um, but does meet the policy intent. The best we can do is believe those with a real lived experience. Believe in them, do what we can to remove obvious avenues for discrimination and disadvantage and support them to be themselves and achieve their full potential. After all, Mr President, isn't this just what we want for our own children? Our nephews, nieces, grandchildren, isn't that what we want, the best for our children? Mr President, there have been some comment, may, uh, mainly in the briefings from some who oppose these changes, as a, about the threat of people being able to self-declare uh, that they are trans or different gender without surgery. According to some, this change will, me, will be used by men wanting to prey on women. We and the broader public need to remember that legally changing gender means doing so in, in your full legal identity. It is not confined to one piece of paper, and even with a birth certificate, a person can only go so far if they do not seem to be serious. There is talk, ignorant talk, about men using legal gender change to allow them to enter women's spaces. First, men rape and assault women in women's spaces now. They do it without wearing women's clothing or taking on aspects of a female identity. Members will recall the shocking incident that occurred in Western Australia in 2006. A little after 4pm on the 26th of June 2006, Dante Arthurs followed eight-year-old Sophie Rodriguez Rita Shu into the toilet in the Livingston Shopping Centre. I remember this. Canning Vale, Western Australia, where he sexually abused and killed her. He didn't wear women's clothes. On the 15th of December 2017, a man sexually assaulted a seven-year-old in the toilet of a Sydney dance studio. He was stopped by the intervention of another man who was stabbed in the struggle before others overcame the attacker. Again, the assailant did not wear women's clothes. Mr President, one woman a week, and sometimes two a week, are killed by their male partner who does so often in their own home and does not need to dress or claim to be a woman to do so. Violence against women is wrong. Anywhere, anytime, any place. Trans people, regardless of whether they seek to change their registered gender or whether or not their gender is noted on their birth certificate, will still be subject to all our laws. Assault and rape are crimes, regardless of who, where or when the crimes are committed. Men don't need to, nor do they wear women's clothing to assault women. Men don't wear women's clothes to enter a women's toilet if they have this intent. The idea that someone would go to the trouble to not only dress up but legally change their gender is <coughs> ludicrous. No one needs to legally, legally change their gender to wear a disguise. Men who assault women often don't disguise themselves as women, but they may, without any change to the legislation. That happens now. No one asked for a birth certificate before entering into women's spaces. Mr President, claims are being made these changes will mean that, there, that there will, we will see men complete a stat deck to enable them to enter women's spaces such as women's toilets, women's shelters and other spaces and therefore, they are therefore nothing more than scaremongering 
and wrong. So I ask these people, how will it enable this? People who say that. I have never been asked to show a birth certificate to prove I'm female to access one of these spaces. And I've accessed a lot of them. I have never been asked to show my birth certificate to access a male toilet, which I've done in the past, both deliberately and accidentally. If a man with a malicious intent wishes to do this, they can now, as evidenced by the previous examples. If this occurs, it is, it is of course a serious matter and needs to be dealt with accordingly. Allowing these proposed changes will not change that. The responsibility to not assault people remains. The reality is that trans women are more likely to be assaulted than non-trans women, both assaulted as women and assaulted because they're trans. There have been various cases of trans women being assaulted as women and, ki and killed when they are found to be trans women who had not had surgery. Research from overseas has clearly shown there is no evidence that trans people represent a danger in bathrooms. These claims that some men will use the opportunity to access safe women's spaces, including women's health and legal services, have also been addressed in a letter we received last year, co-signed by two women's service providers. And this letter states in part, Mr President, it is our position that transgender women are women and they are welcome at our services. WST also argue that transgender women pose a threat to women's safe spaces. There is no research or service experience to suggest that men who seek to harm women change their gender or masquerade as transgender women in order to do so. Acknowledging in law the human rights of transgender people does not reduce the human rights enjoyed by non-transgender people. Protecting women's rights and supporting transgender people are not mutually exclusive. Through our collective experience of providing legal, health, domestic violence and housing services to women, we are already successfully supporting transgender women who, it should be noted, are often themselves victims of violence <coughs> and targeted by people who, uh, by, who use abusive behaviour. Arguments such as those promulgated by WST, which is Women Speak Tasmania, Mr President, only result in greater danger, including physical assaults to transgender women, non-binary individuals and women who do not conform to stereotypes of femininity. And Mr President, we only have to see that photo of um, the amazing AFL football, <coughs> AFLW football, I can't remember her name. Taylor, Taylor Harris, that's right. Um, and the, the disgraceful <coughs> behaviour that went on around that magnificent athlete. So to go back to the letter, Mr President. Um, these attitudes also stand as barriers to gender diverse people accessing services such as these. They remain at greater risk to violence and abuse. Our organisations have always been a safe and welcoming place of all women and they remain so." End quote. Mr President, women's health and or legal services and refuges for women currently enable access to these services for all women, including transgender women, and this won't change. If problems existed now, they would still be the same in the future, and as we've heard, it it hasn't been a problem. Furthermore, as I previously mentioned, I am unaware of any instance where <coughs> individuals have been asked to produce a birth certificate to access gender-specific areas, whether they be public toilets, women's services or other spaces, and this will remain unchanged. There is a lot of scaremongering and fearmongering. The reality is that even without the medical barriers, changing legal gender is not easy. Either one must live as the gender on their documents or face a situation where the documents point to a different gender. Again, this means changing gender and usually one's name on all records in a person's life and facing the questions and attitudes of people as one does. It is not and ever will be something a person does casually. Mr President, it's also disappointing when claims are made in relation to this matter in the absence of checking the facts of the matter. Many of the claims made by the representatives of Women Speak Tasmania suggest that we're on a slippery slope if we pass this law. A number of their claims are based on taking information out of context. An example used in the briefing from WST related to language used by various midwifery organisations, including organisations in Australia, UK, USA and Canada. The use of gender inclusive language is accepted and widely used. It is important when issues arise that may not be covered in current policy documents of organisations providing services to women and men, these documents should be reviewed to ensure matters that need to be addressed are addressed. All of the organisations referred to in that briefing last year by Women Speak Tasmania continue to, despite what they said, 
continue to use word, the words woman or women, breast and breastfeeding and other female-related terminology in their policy documents. Some include advice to assist in determining gender-neutral language to care for transgender men um, who have not had gender reassignment surgery and can give birth or breastfeed. And that is entirely appropriate, that um, gender-specific language is used there. This advice is specific and appropriate in terms of its intended use. When you actually go to those policy documents and look, that's, it's, it's, it's specific and, and appropriate for the terms of its use. There were questions asked, rightly in my view, about this inclusion to ensure women and women-related language is not removed. And I absolutely support that. As a woman, um, I believe that it is very important, who's had to struggle as, you know, with some other discrimination that women have faced over the times. In the policy documents of these organisations, women-centred language has not been removed as suggested, and I'm happy to show members a response to the letter referred to by the representatives of Women Speak Tasmania, supporting the inclusion of gender-neutral language where appropriate if they wish to see that. Scaremongering and the use of information out of context does very little to give credibility to an argument. Concerns were also raised about the competitive advantage that transgender women may have in competitive sports. I acknowledge and accept this can be the case, and as a result, organisations from the Olympic level down, um, the AFL and other sporting, key sporting bodies are working on policies to, do, to address this reality. This is a reality now. Changing this law doesn't change that. Of course, it will take some time in some cases, um, and, it may, and their policies may need amending over time, as more is known. That, that, that's, policies do that. Um, but it is already being addressed and is, currently, uh, and is currently the case for transgender people who have gender reassignment surgery anyway. So this is a matter being considered and dealt with now and this change, if successful, will not impact on it. An email I received claimed that, I quote, this bill will have serious ramifications for sports where women will be the big losers. Biological men can just say they are women and clean up every field and perhaps possibly injure someone else. Quote. Mr President, I'm not aware of any man who just turns up at a footy club, claims to be women, a woman so he can compete in the, in the women's team. On the issue of serious injuries, we have seen serious injuries and the, and the occasional tragic death at all levels of sport now, male and female. You know, it, so it's, it's, it happens in gendered sports that are, are um, single genders. And it's tragic. We do need to do whatever we can to prevent that across all sports. We continue to take measures such as improved helmets for cricketers, <coughs> changes to AFL rules to better protect players' heads, etc. And in my view, this ongoing review will continue to deal with the very real risk associated with contact sports. That's why I don't play them. <laughs> Another claim that there was um, was that uh, quote this would seriously compromise the safety of ch um, safety of children in schools when it comes to teacher supervision, change rooms, dormitories, and accommodation on school camps. It also puts teachers in jeopardy and at risk of having serious sexual allegations made against them if they have to supervise children <coughs> that are not of the same gender. End quote. Mr. President, I am personally glad to see we have more male teachers in our primary schools. It is a reality that many children lack the influence of positive role models in their lives at this important age, and this is, uh, is being provided through more schools, more, and now more in our schools. All teachers have working with children checks and have professional stands to maintain. It's an insult to our male teachers particularly to suggest they would be pedophiles, which is, which is essentially what that was suggesting. It is a reality that many children lack the. In oh, sorry. Um, all um, yeah, this is a manage. This is a matter that is managed every day in our schools now. Changing the law will not change it. All teachers, regardless of their gender, must comply with all laws of this state and Commonwealth laws. Another claim, Mr. President, I really can't explain. That being that the Defence Force will be compromised along with so many other areas. <coughs> Mr President, I cannot for the life of me understand how the Defence Force will be compromised as so much work has been done in the service to foster inclusion, diversity and acceptance. Mr. Mr President, these claims are based on fear and misunderstanding in my view. I'm happy to hear the views of others and will listen to their concerns and I hope those who make them will also be happy to hear my views. And whilst we may agree to differ, and we have, I would hope that we can at least have an honest debate. 
That's all I want, an honest debate. Mr President, many are saying this matter should have been properly considered and there has been no public consultation. That is not the case. This is an area of law reform that's been subject to review and a report by the former Anti-Discrimination Commissioner. This review included public consultation, including such with such organisations as the Australian Christian Lobby and other mainstream churches. This is not a new issue. Transgender people have been meeting with Attorney General since 2004, seeking to update our laws. The government has been consulted numerous times, including on amendments that, to reflect the change we now see in the bill before us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our friend and former colleague, the late Honourable Dr Vanessa Goodwin, did commit to making a number of these changes, and since her untimely death, the Liberals have not acted on these changes. The government has also left dealing with the necessary no-force divorce provisions that they knew had to be finalised by December 9 last year until the last sitting week of that year. They had, they, they had an opportunity with this bill and other times to progress the changes that Vanessa committed to. These changes have also, have also been discussed, um, with, as, as I said, with Attorney General since 2004 uh, and with the current government, including having similar amendments to what we see in the bill proposed back in May last year with no action. There have also been reviews done in other jurisdictions, including Western Australia and Northern Territory, with similar recommendations being made. Mr President, the challenges facing trans people are real and removing avenues for discrimination is important in a tolerant and inclusive society. It's particularly young people these reforms will help. I'm certainly not suggesting these reforms will stop violence and transphobia. They won't. What they will do is reduce the situations where being, a trans, becomes an, where becoming, where being trans becomes an issue for young people. Mr President, the reality is some people are trans. It's not a choice. Most trans people say tr being trans is difficult, but it's far better to address the, their issues and they're happier when they do. We have seen parents of trans young people, we've met older trans people, um, and we are far more a problem to them than they are to us. The parents we met are the ones who support their children and see that, that, we're, um, that they, when they allow themselves, the children to be themselves, they can flourish. Although they may face many, face many challenges with supportive schools and supportive friends, they can just get on with being happy, productive people. There are also young people who aren't supported by their parents. We need to cater for those young people as well. Mr President, the reality is that trans people are just people. Some people have to be trans and part of, a diverse, and part of the diverse humanity to which we all belong. <coughs> Sexual orientation is not something people choose, it's part of who they are, it is how they identify, it is their identity. Throughout history, there have always been trans people. Trans people are not seeking to erase gender or sex, as, be, as is being suggested by some. They know sex is something we are born with. What they seek is an inclusive society where they can be free to be who they are without judgment. Just as I, as a woman, and each of you are, free to be who you are without judgment. They are seeking a freedom to live as they are, without unnecessary and potentially harmful discrimination in a way that harms no one else. Providing choice for all parents, including parents of trans and gender diverse people, is a positive step. This bill expands choice rather than diminishes it. Mr President, I support the intent of the bill as presented to the House and will certainly support into the committee stage, as I believe amendments are necessary to address some of the areas of concern I've had with the bill as presented. Much of this could have been avoided if access to parliamentary council had been granted to those in the other place seeking to make the amendments and then earlier to us last year. Mr President, the provisions of the, in this bill will enhance choice for parents and adults. The provisions in the bill won't hurt anyone and will help a number of people directly. Mr President, there has been a lot of comment in the media that completely misrepresents the policy intent and impact of this proposed change. Much of the commentary has been untruthful, scaremongering and very harmful to the members of our community who are Tasmanians, just like us. I wish to conclude with some words of Tim... Uh, I can't pronounce his surname, Mr President, but he's... Do you know what it is? No. No? Is he an Australian academic, I believe it is a Tim. University of Sydney professor and social commentator and the formal racial discrimination commissioner? He's got a very long name. I apologise, I can't pronounce his name. So, yes, yeah, that's it. Something like that, yeah. Is that, oh, that's what it is. Thank you, Member for Romney. Um, but he made these comments in recent days related to an act of extremism 
hate and prejudice. And whilst it's a different event, these words absolutely apply here. And I'll finish with these. Sometimes the most powerful thing for those feeling vulnerable is to know there are people who stand beside them. Those who feel vulnerable can often forget that the majority of people are people of goodwill and understanding. If you hear or see something hateful and it's safe to speak up, it's safe for me, you should do so. It makes a big difference for people to hear that others will stand up for what's right. It's powerful to hear others reject intolerance and prejudice. It's, all, it's not always as simple as having good intentions. There are plenty of examples of people meaning well but missing the mark. Avoiding what is, that is, sorry, avoiding that is best done when people take time to listen closely to those affected by an issue, feel and experience. Extend the hand of friendship. Have a chat. It doesn't involve rocket science. End quote. Mr President, if this bill is supported with some amendments, it will advance our just, tolerant, inclusive and diverse society, and that must be better for all of us. The question is the bill be read as the Honourable Member for Rosevears. Uh, 